There is no downside to being a strong problem solver. Hello and a very good afternoon to all of you. I am Nadi Par and I welcome you all to today's webinar. The topic of uh, the topic is problem solving strategies. Solving strategies for competitive coding and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. The webinar is organized by CodeArts, an SIG of IEEE, the North Cap University Student Branch. Competitive programming is solving problems revolving around the algorithms and data structures as quickly as possible. The kinds of problems that you will be called on to solve and the kinds of debugging, fixes, and answers that you will generate are exactly the kind of work that major corporations are needing to be done. Training for coding competitions is great experience for all the programmers. Therefore, we believe that competitive programming gives an insight to approach, pro approach problems refining the very raw innate talents that we all have. Thus, with the utmost delight, I would love to introduce you all to our speaker, Sumit Sir. He is an assistant professor in the department of CSC in the North Cap University and also a faculty advisor in CODAT. Hello. Hello, Sir. Hi, Nandeep. Sir is an Oracle certified professional Java programmer. He is a committed research researcher and has presented many papers in various national and international conferences. His research areas include, include adversarial machine learning, privacy and security, advanced data structures and algorithms, reverse engineering, etc. Thank you to all the attendees for joining us today. We will be running a live question and answers web session at the end of the webinar. So if you have any questions, just pop them in the live chat box, which will be answered post coverage content coverage of the content. So without any further ado, I would request you, sir, to take over. The platform is all yours. Glad to have you here with us today. Thank you, Nandi, for such a warm introduction. And thanks to IEEE student branch of different universities that have collaborated together and Team Code Arts, of course, for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this webinar series on competitive programming. So let's get started. So as you all know, the topic for this webinar is problem solving strategies for competitive coding. And before going ahead to different problem solving strategies, let me first introduce you to what competitive programming actually is. So a competitive programming is a mind sport, just like chess. It teaches us how to think. And I literally mean that when, uh, when you write some code, you compile it, you must uh, at the very first stage, you may get a wrong answer and you make some changes. Then you do some minor tweaks and you compile it again and boom, you pass all the required test cases. So this is how you play around competitive programming. Now, uh, there is a small distinction bec uh, between competitive programming and software development. Competitive programming is not related to software development in any manner. Software development, uh, the main focus is to fulfill the functional objective or the functional requirements of the given software using a bunch of libraries or frameworks that are provided to us. But on the other hand, in case of competitive coding or competitive programming, our main focus is on solving the given problem in the best way possible. So, and along with that, keeping in mind uh, within the constraints of space and time complexities. So the most important part of competitive programming is when you think about the problem, you make some changes, then you analyze the constraints, you make some more changes again, and then you get the desired results. So this complete process of thinking and arriving at the best possible solution for giving the problem uh, at the best possible solution for the given problem as what we call as competitive programming. And this game of competitive programming is recognized and supported by all the almost all the big tech giants like Google, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, IBM, to name a few. And not only big tech companies, but startups too hire directly from these programming contests. Now, what do these contests test? Well, the main objective of this sport is to make you think on how to solve a problem in the best possible manner. So all of these things will be achieved when you focus on your algorithmic skills, your basic mathematical skills, your logical thinking, your programming th uh, programming skills, of course, speed, yes, good speed helps, good typing speed helps. 
creativity so it tests you how much creative you are when you are presenting a solution along with that your debugging skills will also be required now along with that the next question comes how to get started well just like the game of chess or any other game you should be aware of all the rules on how to play them effectively and efficiently the first rule of the of competitive programming is the sound knowledge of algorithms and data structures along with that you should know the concept of time and space complexity and when i should solve the problem in the best possible manner it means your solution should take less amount of memory and it should take less amount of time or it should be executed within the stipulated constraints the second thing just like any other game say a game of cricket you choose the type of ball depending upon the format for which you are playing like white ball is used for odis and red ball is used for test games similarly in the game of competitive programming you need to choose a programming language which you are most comfortable with and which helps you in solving a particular problem efficiently so along with that there are different programming paradigms that we are going to discuss today like dynamic programming is there recursion is there uh, greedy algorithms number theory modular arith arithmetic logarithmic exponential uh, exponentiation etc okay so the next question comes how to approach a problem in competitive programming contest so there are certain properties of a problem that is given on any of the big competitive programming platform and all of these properties will uh, will get or will contain some of the standard terms like the problem statement the input format the output format the constraints that are defined some sample input and output just to make you realize that how uh, the input and output is going to be there and the explanation of those sample output some in some cases or in some platforms the explanation is optional but most of the platforms like hacker earth or lead code all of these explanations are given there and let me show you one sample uh, platform which gives you uh, a feel a look and feel of how a competitive programming question looks like so here is the problem uh, uh, here is the uh, the competitive programming question which states that it uh, the Ch uh, chandu is a bad student and once his teacher asked him to print the reverse of a given string so this is the problem statement given and then there are some input and output statement given the input says that the first line contains an integer value t so t usually denotes either the size of the input or uh, the number of test cases the second term is it says that each test case contains a string s Com uh, comprising only lower case characters so the first value in sample input always contain the number of test cases and the subsequent lines below that will contain uh, all these uh, all those input values along with that the the very important part is constraints so here some of the constraints are defined like the value of uh, or the length of that uh the the uh, the number of test cases should be less than 10 and the length of that particular string should be less than 30 characters so this is how a usual question on competitive programming looks like along with that they will also give you some standard time limit usually it is 1 second sometime it goes up to 100 seconds as well depending upon the type of problem it is but for most of the cases like say for 90% of the cases it is 1 second at max and then the memory limit for most of the questions or problem statement is 256 mb so this is a standard so when you code your solution you make sure that you are fulfilling all these constraints and all these uh, uh, this time and memory limit as well and along with that they will give you uh, uh, your uh, your coding editor on which you will write the code and you you can choose your uh, any programming language of your choice in which you are comfortable with one more thing whenever you approach any problem or any problem statement in competitive programming you must read it carefully understand what it is trying to solve and usually it contains a background story just like this one to hide the actual problem and to make it interesting now after getting 
uh, all about what the problem is, we think of different possible solutions. So this is where we have different problem solving strategies that comes into play. Don't start coding yet. Coding part will start when you analyze all the constants that are given over here. And these constants will help you in identifying the time and space complexity that is required. After thinking about these constants, you can code the solution. But before that, you must check the input and output format as well. Finally, you will move ahead and submit your solution. You check if there is any runtime error and whether all the solutions have passed the sample run or not. And finally, you will check whether your solution is within the constraints of the given time and memory limit. One more thing that I would like to uh, highlight here is there is no console input statements allowed in, in any programming uh, competitive programming contest because their compiler or runtime machine will check the standard output file with your output that you give. So the correctness of an, of an answer to the problem should be absolute. It will be checked by the computer and not humans. So there is no subjective uh, subjectiveness uh, is present at that time. Now let me take you uh, through the first example on how to see and approach a problem. So it says that let's say you are new to competitive programming and you have been asked to simply print the reverse of a given string. Along with that, you are given some constants here like the number of test cases should be less than 10 and the length of the input string should be between 1 to 30 characters. Now just pause for a moment and think about the solution, how to reverse a string. Well, there are multiple approaches to it. Let me show you. So I have mentioned four approaches to this problem over here. The approach one says that we will swap the first element with the last one and then the second last element, uh, the second element with the second last one, and we'll continue doing it until we reach half of the length of the string. Okay, this seems efficient. The second approach says we will use a temporary array and copy the whole string in the reverse direction, starting from the end till the beginning. Okay, this solution will uh, is what comes to my mind in the very first time when the very first time I uh, enc I encountered with this kind of problem. But I will tell you what uh, what exactly uh, or what the cost for this approach will be. The third approach is which many smart guys over here can uh, can tell or can use is simply need uh, you use a built in function that is given over there for any programming language. Like if you are using Java, there is a reverse function given over there. If you are using C++, yes, there is a reverse function given over there. So use a built in function. This is my approach three. The last approach is it says simply print the elements from the end. Yes, that's it. So let me tell you the qualities or the, the, the pros and cons of each of these approaches. The first approach, which says that you swap the element, the last element with the first one and continue to do so till you reach half of the uh, half of the string. Sure, it is uh, time, time efficient. It, uh, sorry, it is space efficient because it is not uh, will not need any extra or any temporary array for that, but it needs some or it incurs some time in swapping those elements. The second approach, which rather like uh, rather looks quite simple, it says that we'll we'll be needing some extra space in the form of a temporary array where we will store the complete string in a reverse direction. So the space complexity is little bit higher in this approach. So we will not consider any of the solution which requires more space because there are there are always uh, constraints related to space complexity. The third approach, which says that use a built-in function. Well, if you are using a built-in function, then it depends upon the particular programming language, how it has implemented that function at its core. That function may take a, a time of order of n or it may take in a, an exponential time. So it depends upon the programming language alone. The final approach, which is approach number four, which says that why not simply print, it, print the elements from the end? This approach seems to be uh, seems to be time efficient as well as space efficient to me. So this is how you approach to a problem, and this is how you uh, you you come up with a better solution. 
Now the next question comes: Where to practice? Now there are many online platforms which contains problem to practice with uh, varying different uh, sorry difficulty levels, and some of them are mentioned over here, like Top Coder, Code Forces, Spodge, which is Spear Online Judge. This is the uh, the old one. Code Chef is there, which is very popular. Then Hacker Earth, Hacker Rank, and the new guy, which is Lead Code. Uh, and uh, and there are many more along with that so many of these uh, competitive programming platforms provide monthly challenges for you to practice and then at the, uh, from time to time there are hackathons which are introduced or which are uh, organized at all of these platforms now some of the tips for competitive programming from my end the first one is practice of course learning to code is all about practicing participate regularly in in the programming contest solve the problems that you cannot solve in the contest and try to solve them after the contest and apart from some leading platforms online coding platforms like top coder code forces you can also look at hacker earth challenges or lead code monthly challenges and and even code chefs code chef challenges also now the second thing is analyze analyze the problem analyze the solution also read the code of highly rated programmers compare your solution with them and many times you will see that it is simpler and shorter than your solution that you have proposed so analyze how they have approached and improve your implementation skills the third tip is read editorials yes reading editorials is one of the most important part of competitive programming you can learn how to solve a problem that you are not able to solve in the contest and you you will even even be able to learn the alternative ways to solve a particular problem which you could solve uh, with uh, with another defined approach now the question comes why you should do competitive programming well everyday skill uh, you will enhance your everyday skills skills related to your algorithm your your problem solving skills your mathematical skills and logical skills along with that will be able to manage your time effectively stress management is there and yes of course mental stamina and endurance will increase then you will be get specialized in special in uh, in different advanced algorithms including ai and machine learning so nowadays many of these uh, online competitive coding platforms are giving problem statements which are related to machine learning so you will get better at that also third thing is you will spend more time on coding and debugging that uh, debugging your solutions so surely a normal coding program coding a program normally will help you but if you are spending a lot of time in giving uh, in approaching to problems and debugging them regularly this will surely enhance your uh, your problem solving attitude next thing is it enables you to think more clear, clearly and more properly like i said before it will increase your problem solving uh, your your problem solving and, and thinking uh, uh, with a very uh, you know effective way and most importantly it might help you in getting into the so called fang so fang stands for facebook amazon netflix and google it's just a acronym so if you do regular competitive programming and if you become the star or the top coder in any of the platforms that i have mentioned before yes big giants like fang will uh, will take will see your profile and will directly call you for a coding interview from there itself some of the draw drawbacks so if you are a passionate competitive programmer you may face these drawbacks for sure back pain insomnia not even competitive programming be be a part of if you are if you are passionate about anything in life you will surely face these drawbacks the next comes different problem solving strategies okay so this is the main thing that we are doing here today so in the world of competitive programming there is no silver bullet that is a cure for all types of problem statements different problems use different kinds of techniques and a good problem solver as a good problem solver you should be aware about some standard problem solving strategies like divide and conquer you should be aware about different searching and sorting algorithms you should be aware about how hashing is efficient than a normal search algorithm you should be aware about 
greedy techniques or greedy algorithms like shortest path, knapsack, Huffman coding, to name a few. Then there is graph theory, which is another more uh, most important part. And dynamic programming. Now, dynamic programming is a complete course in it is uh, in itself, and it might need a separate webinar to cover. And backtracking. So we'll be cover, we'll be uh, seeing one example which is related to backtracking here. Along with that, it it comes under recursion. So solving a problem recursively, which will also enhance your problem solving capability. Now, as I said before, to write effective code, you need to be aware of space and time complexity of a particular problem. So let's let's check this example. And here, what you have to do is you have to tell the space and time complexity of the code. So there are two variables given A and B initialized with a value zero and two loops are given. And this the first for loop will run from zero to nth value, so n is some random integer value, and what it will do is it will calculate it will uh, calculate a random value and it will add it to its own uh, its own initialized value. So it will just sum up and it will generate a random value and sum sum that value to itself. So this random is a predefined function. It can be taken from any of the programming language. This a similar kind of functionality is done in the second loop also. It will also run from zero till uh, some mth value, which is some random integer, and it will again compute a random value and uh, present it to you. So what you have to do is you have to tell what is the complete time complexity as well as the space complexity of this particular code. There is a small note given, which assumes that this predefined function random will take order of one time, and it will also take order of one space complexity. OK, so pause for a moment and think about it. What uh, could be the possible space and time complexity for this particular problem? Let's see the, uh, the solution approach. As you can see over here, there are two loops which are given, but none of these loops are actually dependent on one other because there is there is no uh, there is no nested loops are given since the, these loops are separated. So at, uh, when we complete, when we compute the total time complexity, we must add it and we must not multiply it. So let's say a single operation will take order of one time. Then if I run this loop for n times, then this loop will take order of n time complexity. Similarly, the second loop, since this loop will turn uh, will run for m times so let's say it will take a total order of m complexity and since both of these loops are not related or are not dependent on each other so the overall complexity that will be incurred in this case is order of m plus n okay so this is the time complexity now what about the space complexity as you can see here we are simply taking two random variables a and b which will acquire order of one or constant space since there is no arrays introduced. So the overall space complexity that is incurred in this code is order of one or constant. So here is it. Here, here it is. If you see the second point, it says that space complexity is measured in terms of largest amount of memory used during runtime. And since in our question, there is no array introduced, so the overall space complexity is order of one or constant. So here is the complete solution given. Now you can also say that instead of writing order of n plus m, suppose the value of m is way uh, greater than or is much greater than the value of n. Say the value of m is in millions and the value of n is in few hundreds then in that case the value of n will get neglected and the overall complexity of the of the previous code will become order of m so you can also do like that so this is just one basic example of how you can figure out the time and space complexities i would suggest you to read any good book on algorithm or tutorials given on geeks for geeks or any youtube channel to learn more about this because it will come handy when you practice more problems on your competitive coding platforms.
Okay, let's jump to another example. And this example is based on arrays. It says, given a list of non-negative integers, arrange them such that they form the largest number. Okay, so we are given an array of random integers. So here are, here are the integers available to us in this example, 3, 30, 34, 5, 9. And our job is to combine them in such a way that we get the largest number possible. So here in this case, the largest formed number is 9534330. Along with that, there is a small note given which says the result may be very large. So you need to return a string instead of an integer. Now, this is a very important point. When you are working on numbers in any of, the, of your programming contest, you make sure that you choose a database or sorry, a data, a data type which is uh, large enough so that it can acquire the large values, the large integer values. Suppose you take an integer and your uh, your solution or your final value that you are returning is very huge. It is out of uh, the bounds of that uh, or out of the range of that integer data type. So in that case, you have to uh, choose double instead of integer data type. So make sure that you are aware of that. When you cover the number theory part, in, uh, in in your basics of competitive programming, you will learn about all this. Now comes the solution approach. So pause for a moment and think of the possible solution approach to this problem. Now let's see that the different uh, solution approach to these problems, what are given. The first thing that comes to my mind when I read this problem was uh, to, to sort all these numbers given in this array over here in ascending order that is from largest to smallest and then merge them or these elements into a single largest values. So as you can see in this example, suppose I have a given number 548 and 60. So in this case, 548 is greater than uh, 548 and 60. If I merge it, so the whole number becomes 54860. But think about it. This approach won't give me the correct solution. For example, in this case, suppose if I have two numbers which are 98 and 9, 98 is greater than 9, but if I merge 9 before 98, the complete value becomes greater than the previous one. So if you see this clearly, it says that 998, that means if I merge the smaller number first, then that particular total value is greater than if I merge 9 after 98. Okay, so there is this uh, there is that the, this trick that comes into play. So it is not that easy as it looks. The second and better approach to this problem would be to use any comparison based sorting algorithm like a selection sort, bubble sort, or merge sort, heap sort, any any comparison based sorting algorithm. And instead of uh, going with the default comparison, write your own comparison function. And this comparison function would take two numbers as input values like x and y. It appends them and then it checks which case gives us the largest value. For example, let's say the value of x and y be 542 and 60. Now to compare x and y, we compare, uh, we first append them together. So the first, uh, in the first case, it becomes 54260. And in the second case, if I append y to x, it becomes 60542. Now, since 60542 is greater than 54260, so we put, five, uh, we put y first. That is, we, uh, we will take the second case as our result. So this is how you can approach in solving this problem. This, the next example is based on linked list. And let me read out the problem to you. It says that we have to merge two sorted linked list and return it as a new list. Okay, the new list should be made by splicing together the nodes of the first two lists and it should be sorted. So in simple terms, it says that we are provided with two lists which are already sorted and our job is to merge them together and the final list that will be obtained to us will also be in a sorted format. So if you see the very first line, which says merge to sorted link list, what comes to your mind first? Well, to me, merge sort comes first to solve this kind of problem. But it looks like uh, 
if you see merge sort by default is not an in place sorting algorithm it uses an additional link list or an array depending upon on what data structure you are working instead of doing that what we are going to do is we are going to merge these two list by changing the references of a node to point to the next smallest item let me repeat it again what we are going to do is we are going to merge the two list by changing the references uh, like the example given over here by changing their references of a node to point to the next smallest item so if i take this example suppose we have two list one two four and three eight nine ten and what we have to do first we have to compare both of these nodes since a value of one is less than three we'll move ahead again two is less than three so what we will do we will change the next pointer reference of two and we'll point it to three like this given over here then our pointer will now point to the this third element now we will compare three with four since the value of three is less than four so what we will do we will uh, change its next value or next reference pointer and we'll point it to four and similarly since four is less than eight so we'll point the next part of this particular value element to the next element which is eight and since this list is completely null now so we will append all the remaining elements which are left behind in the second list as it is along with that you should uh, take care of the corner cases as well so the corner cases are the ones which you see as constraints in your problem statements so here you may uh, you need to make sure that at the end of the loop when one of the list goes empty you do include remaining elements from the second list in your answer so this is what we are doing over here we are adding the remaining elements to our final list okay so this is how you approach to this kind of problem all right so the next problem looks pretty interesting and it is related to backtracking now backtracking is another problem solving strategy where as we search for a solution we may we, we may reach to a dead end and when we have to go back to the previous step for example the maze problem you are given a starting point you are given an ending point and it between there there are some obstructions and what you have to do you have to find the correct path to reach to the destination so this is what a maze problem is now let me read out this uh, the question it says given a set of candidate numbers denoted by c and a target number denoted by t you have to find all the unique combinations in c where the candidate numbers sums up to t all right the same repeated number may be chosen from c unlimited number of times okay pretty interesting so it says that i have been given a set which is represented by c which represents the number of candidates and i have to form some unique pairs such that the sum of all the all those elements or all those numbers should be equal to the target number which is represented by t there is a small note given it says that all the numbers should be positive integers and the solution set must not contain duplicate combinations okay but this is this line is pretty interesting it says that the same number uh, same repeated number may be chosen from the given candidate set okay now let's see how to approach for this problem you think about it for a moment okay let me first show you an example so here in example 1 i have been given the input candidates so some uh, some numbers are given like 2 3 6 7 and there is a target value t which is 7 so what what i have to do is i have to make a combination set from this particular array in such a manner that the sum of all those numbers should be equal to the target value which is 7 and the condition given to me is let me go back to the previous slide it says that i can use the same number multiple times unlimited number of times okay so that means if i am going to see the very first element which is 2 i have to make a set using the number 2 such that the com uh, the the complete value or the overall value or the sum of that value will become equals to 7 so one such combination such possible combination is 
two, two, three. Since it is given in the question that I can repeat this particular element any number of times. So I have repeated it two times and then I have used another number or the second digit, which is three. And if I sum it up, it will be equals to the target value, which is seven. Another possible combination is the number itself. Now, in the next slide, I will tell you how I have approached in solving this problem. Let me see. Uh, let us see the example number two. It says that input candidates are two, three, five, and the target value is eight. So that means I have to make the possible number of combinations using these three elements such that the sum of those combinations should be equal to the target value, which is eight. So one such combination combination is as you look at this, this particular digit straight away, it comes to your mind that four times two will become eight. So what's such, one such combination is this. Another possible combination is one time two and two time three number. So if you sum it up, it will again be equals to eight because it is given in the question that I can repeat this particular element any number of times. But the only constant is the value inside here should be positive and any combination that you obtain should not get repeated. Fine. So pause for a moment and think about the possible solution that you can approach. OK, so one such solution approach is given over here. It says that first we will sort the given combination set that is given to us. For example, if this is the combination, the number of candidates that are given to us are two, three, six, seven. So it is already sorted. Our first job is to sort them. And then after sorting them, we have to make combinations using a particular integer value or element value one by one. So every number will go up to four stages. And let me tell you this, this kind of problem is a subset sum problem and it can be easily solved using depth first search. Now, how do I know that through practice? If you practice problems on depth first search, you will get to know that this kind of problem, which which needs uh, which needs us in forming a combination from a given set can be easily solved using depth first search. Now, let me explain you what they are doing here. So the target value that we want to achieve is seven and this is the input combination. Now we will pick the first value which is at index zero. So in, at index zero, we have two and we will make all the possible combinations using this particular element such that the overall sum of that combination is equals to seven. So if you add two and two together, it will be four. It is not equals to seven. Now we further explore it again. If we add two, three times, it will become six. So again, six is less than seven. If we add two, four times, then it will become eight. So this time our results, our result goes in negative, uh, ne uh, negative integer value. So what we will do is we will not move to the final step or the fourth step. Instead of doing that, we will recur back or we will backtrack to the initials uh, to the previous stage, which is the third stage. So what we will do instead of using two, we will use the next available element to us. The next available element to us from that combination set is three. So we will create a combination set using two, two and three. So two times two, the first digit and one times the second digit, which is three. And if you sum it up, the overall combination or the sum of this combination is equals to the target value, which is seven. So this is our first possible combination. Now, since we have found our first combination value using the second element itself, we will not move further because it is not possible to obtain another combination which is equals to the target value. So what we will do, we will again backtrack to the second position uh, to the second level. So this time we will check two plus three since two plus three is five which is less than seven, we will move, move to the next element. So the next element is six. Two plus six is again eight, which is greater than seven. So we will straight away deny it and we will not move further. Instead of doing that, we will backtrack to the very first stage. So we will again come back to the first stage. And now two is covered. We will see three. Since we have already neglected second, third and fourth stage, we will not move further. 
3 is less than the target value so we will uh, we will now check the next combination the next number in our set next number is 6 6 is less than 7 so it is also not possible and the final number is 7 which is equals to the target value 7 itself so the two possible combination that we got from this uh, input set are 2 2 3 and 7 itself so this is how uh, we sh we should approach a problem like this i know it is a little it is little bit difficult to understand it in one go i would uh, suggest you to again read the problem statement and check how depth first search works and then come back to this video and uh, play it again how this solution approach will work moving to another example this example is based upon greedy algorithms so a greedy algorithm as the name suggests always makes the choice that seems to be the best at that moment this means that it makes a locally optimal choice in the hope that this choice will lead to a globally optimal solution now let's let me read this problem and see how this works so it says that there are n light bulbs which are connected to a wire and each bulb has a switch associated with it okay however there is a condition here however due to faulty wiring a switch also changes the state of all the bulbs to the right of that current bulb it means that because of this faulty wiring issue in case if you change the state of any switch all the bulbs connected to the right of that particular switch will change their state automatically interesting the next line says given an initial stage of all the bulbs you have to find out the number of switches you have to press to turn on all the bulbs okay so here we will be greedy about the maximum number of choices or the maximum number of instances we need to press a switch such that all of the bulbs that we are given are turned on now you can press the same switch multiple times and there is a one note given which says zero represents the bulb is off and one represents the bulb is on all right then along with that there is a input format the input format says the first and the only argument contains an integer array a of size n all right so we will we are given an array which is of size n and the output format says it will return an integer which represents the minimum number of switches required to turn on all the bulbs that are given in this array a fine along with that there are some constants so the constant says the number uh, the total number of integers that are that are present that should be present inside array a should be less than 5 into 10 to the power 5 so in most of the programming contest the maximum range that goes for this input constant is 4 into 10 to the power 8 because they suppose that a single processor in today's generation will take maximum 10 to the power 8 operations in one second means it performs maximum 10 to the power 8 operations in one second so here we have uh, uh, supposedly a less uh, in range value and the second constant says that individual item present inside this array should be between the range of 0 and 1 so it could be either it could be 0 or it could be 1 and they have given one example also great so this is optional in some of the coding platforms they will give you an example for better understanding along with the example they will give you explanation as well but in some of the coding uh, platforms they will maybe they will give you a, an example but explanation is very much optional it depends on the author who has designed that problem set so here the input says that array a has only a single value which is one that means a single switch or a single bulb is given and the output is zero it is zero because remember what is the output the output should be the minimum number of switches that you have to press in order to turn on the bulbs since inside this array a the bulb is already turned on remember state one states that the switch is on or the bulb is on so zero number of uh, 
so uh, uh, means we need we need not press any switch in order to turn on the bulb because it is already turned on and the input to they have given another example here inside the array a th these are the initial states which says the first bulb is off represented by 0 second bulb is on represented by 1 and then 0 1 so on and the output says that the number of switches that you have to press in order to turn on all the bulbs is 4 how it is so they have given the steps also they have first pressed switch number 0 switch number 0 means the bulb present at index value 0 so when you press any bulb its state changes from 0 to 1 and all the bulbs that are there to the right of it will uh, their state will also get automatically changed so as i press this its state change from 0 to 1 along with that all the bulbs that reside to the right of it will also change their state so it will become 1010 in the next step they have pressed switch 1 means the bulb which is there at index position 1 so this particular thing so when they press this particular switch its state will get changed from 0 to 1 and all the bulbs that are available to the right of it will also change their states automatically so this will become 1 and this thing to the right of it at index value 2 will become 0 and the last element or the last bulb will become 1 so this is my final result and then in the next uh, in the next case they have pressed the switch 2 means switch available at index position 2 so this is the switch that is available at index position 2 and as we press this particular switch it will change its state from 0 to 1 and all the bulbs that are available to the right of it will be changed automatically and so previously its state was 1 now its states changed from z uh, from 1 to 0 and the final step is they pressed switch number 3 and this will give us the state as 1 for all the bulbs that means now all the bulbs have turned on so the total number of steps required in order to uh, in order to turn on all the bulbs is 4 now coming to the solution approach it says that the uh, the order in which you press the switch does not affect the final state if you see this example here we have started pressing the switches from left and then we move to the right but our solution approach says that order will not affect the final state that means we can proceed with any random order so i have given an example over here if you press switch 2 first this will be the state then if you press uh, switch 3 means uh, the switch available at index position 3 this will be the state of the bulbs and similarly finally if you press switch 1 at the fourth uh, at, at the fourth time all the bulbs will turn on so this is the proof of concept that the order in which you press the switches will not affect the final state therefore we can choose any particular order but to make things easier for us to understand we always go from left to right so what you need to do is you need to uh, apply a loop and inside that loop you can start from uh, 0 to n n being the size of that array and let and then you compare the value of the switch if it is 0 you will change it to 1 so this is how it works all right so that is all from my side so we have covered some basic problem solving strategies like greedy algorithms backtracking recursion problems related to strings problems related to arrays and linked list along with that we have also learned uh, how to approach for competitive programming how to approach for uh, for a particular solution or a particular problem statement and the different uh, platforms that are available to us in in the field of or in the game of competitive programming nandi over to you thank you sir for such an insight, insightful session packed with massive knowledge and values. Well, with that, we are open to a question and answer session. We will have the questions rolling off the screen. Can we have the first question on the screen, please? So the first question is from Sunny Singh. 
what is meant by no additional constraints in problem sub stacks okay so the statement no additional constraints simply means that apart from what they have explicitly told you to apply the constant values they are not supposing or they are not uh, uh, means uh, they are not uh, suggesting that you should apply any corner cases in between like the the limit on the length of that of that particular problem the the combination array the the set that we are forming so they are uh, they mean to uh, uh, means they mean it by uh, by saying that no additional constants are required it simply means that there is nothing uh, else from your side is required like no uh, corner cases should be there to be to be more specific okay so it Next is related question. to corner cases next question is from kuldeep singh that uh, how space, how complexity space complex complexity is com calculated okay in order to calculate space complexity you have to check what all the data structures uh, that you are using in case if you are using an additional array then that means your stack will will acquire some amount of space so suppose if your uh, your array is of length 5 then five number of cells will be acquired in your stack so the complexity will become order of 5 similarly that number goes to n times so in that case that uh, the the space complexity for that particular problem can be order of n so the type of data structure that you are going to use in your problem in your coding part will actually define the space complexity of your solution uh next question is how can we analyze time complexity of the algorithms okay so time complexity calculation is a complete course in itself and i suggest you to refer to clrs book of algorithm a very famous it, it is also the bible of algorithm if you go to that book you will study how you can uh, calculate time complexities of algorithm both in case of linear uh, pr uh, linear problem solutions as well as recursive problem solutions so there are uh, it is a it is a huge topic and i cannot tell you in a single statement how to analyze a, uh, the time complexity it will take a complete webinar for itself and so the same question is from uh, him only where are sorting algorithms are used and which algorithm is best for sorting well sorting algorithms is used uh, as the name suggests they are used to sort the element values in any of the order so if your problem statement requires to order your elements given then you you have to use sorting algorithm the order could be ascending or descending and which algorithm is best for sorting well it depends upon the worst case time complexity of that particular algorithm suppose if you if i talk about bubble sort the worst case time complexity of bubble sort is order of n square and on at the same time if i talk about merge sort the best and the worst case time complexity of merge sort is order of n log n so if you uh, if you want to compare or if you have a choice to select any of these two always pick the one whose worst case time complexity is less okay uh, and the next question is how can we find complexity in data structure well again uh, finding time complexity in data structure is a complete topic in itself and i suggest you to read about uh, calculating best case worst case uh, and uh, average case time complexities these are also called as logarithmic time complexities or uh omega big theta and uh, the other thing is big omega big theta and means these uh, these are the notations that you can use to represent represent this so i suggest you to refer to the clrs book to check how to find the time complexity of any algorithm or any of the problem statement or problem solution The next question is: Does any practicing software, Dave, and not CP, decrease changes for cracking interview? No, it is not like that. See, if you practice more on competitive programming, then it will increase your problem-solving skills. But if you practice more on software development part, sure, you can 
uh, fulfill the functional requirements of any software that you have developed or any project that you have developed in your engineering career or engineering life, uh, your student life, sorry. But that particular, uh, you know, that that problem solving attitude or the uh, the the thinking that you have to solve this problem in the best possible manner, in an efficient and effective way, that might uh, means you might lack that in case if you only focus on developing software uh, softwares. Now, of course, along with learning CP, you should develop some projects, some softwares in your uh, in your student life, so that later on when you uh, arrive at the interview you can showcase them that you have done these uh, you have done these projects and how you have applied the knowledge that you have gained from competitive programming over software development okay what does this mean so question asking okay iOS underscore base sync with TDIO false cn dot tie. Uh, I think this is related to C plus plus. This syntax is uh, related to C plus plus. I need to check it because I'm not very good at C plus plus syntax. Uh, I'm very well aware about Java, about C, but okay, I, I have to check it. I have to uh, search about it. Explain whether it's possible to use binary search for linked list. Oh, haven't you Googled it? It is it is very simple to, uh, to say. It is not possible to use binary search for linked list. The simple reason it you in linked list, there is no way to get the index of uh, the middle element since the uh, the index value of the linked list are random. They are randomly placed. That that was the purpose of that, that data structure. Okay. So can you tell about Precocites and resources of OCJ certification. Okay, uh, the prerequisites are changed now. Uh, as of as of uh, this year 2020, I think before going ahead with the OCJP certification, you have to pass the OCJ associate certificate first, and then you will be uh, you can apply for the OCJP certification. Okay. So I think, sir, that we are towards the end of the webinar. It was very detailed and very knowledgeable. And uh, I think uh, that we are done with this. And uh, the link for the feedback form has been sent in the description box. And we would love to know the responses. E-certificates will be provided in 10 business working days. Until then, stay safe and stay tuned for more insightful session. Hope to see you all there. Thank you so much, sir. Well, thank you everyone for having me.